So the talk will be about uh, biomonitoring oxidative stress. Is biomonitoring oxidative stress and DNA damage still relevant in the era of the extra zone? And um, this will be uh, looking at some comet assay uh, data, some that, that we've contributed, um, some of the highlights, hopefully, um, and also some of the bigger picture related to uh, this new field, the exposome and exposomics. So brief introduction. Talking about the exposome, what it is, oxidative stress, um, you probably don't need to know any of that because you know it already. Um, talking about targeted approaches, of which Comitasse is one of them, and then untargeted approaches, which is in the emerging field. As uh, you're all aware, um, disease is due to uh, the gene X environment uh, interactions, but it's more environment than gene. And so we need to look at the environment. And uh, back in 2005, uh, Chris Wilde, um, then director of IARC and uh, professor of molecular epidemiology at the University of Leeds, came up with the idea of the exposome, um, drawing on the idea of omics being the totality of something or other, uh, transcriptomics, proteomics, genomics, and then extending this to the uh, exposure, um, bit, the idea that's, that, that the risk, health risk and impact is all due to the totality of the exposures. Um, uh, across the lifespan. And these exposures can come from the specific or general external environment, the internal environment, and these combine to give you a health risk assessment. And the environment is obviously very, very complicated. <clears throat> and I think this figure um, illustrates it nicely, showing uh, just representative small molecules and uh, metals found in the blood. And we're looking about thousands of chemicals. So, um, so what we need to do is kind of understand how does exposure lead to disease? And some of that uh, is because the exposure leads to damage uh, via various mechanisms, one of which that's often um, discussed as oxidative stress, um, leading to modification of DNA in particular. So there's multiple forms of damage from all sorts of sources, ionizing radiation, X-rays and so on, um, laser pointer, UV light, chemicals, you, you can't avoid it. Your, your own body's damaging you. And this leads to a variety of uh, DNA lesions, and then they're countered to some extent by um, DNA repair pathways. And in the case of oxidatively gen generated damage, there's over 100 of these, at least 20 of which are nuclear-based modifications. So it's a very complicated or complex um, picture that we're looking at when we try to uh, dissect exposure and the consequences of exposure, which is damage. Okay, so that's highlighting that we should be looking at repair as well. Okay, so uh, damage occurs in a number of places to uh, nuclear DNA damage, uh, mitochondrial DNA damage, and damage to the nucleotide pools. And the consequence of this is that the damage can be misincorporated by DNA polymerases, and that you end up with damage present in the uh, DNA as if it had been formed in situ. This is countered by um, base excision repair, uh, producing nuclear-based products. And this is an important thing that we'll come back to in a bit. Um, also, the, the nucleotide precursor pools are sanitized um, to prevent the, pre, uh, the misincorporation. And these produce, so we think at least, uh, two prime deoxynucleoside, uh, modi modified two prime deoxynucleosides. And then there's also a contribution from um, global uh, NER and TCR, which some people think also generate uh, two prime deoxynucleus sites. And it's thought that once excised, excised, all this damage appears in the urine. Um, and the cellular consequences of oxidative stress and DNA damage are, are manifold. And uh, in the interest of time, I won't go into the details of this, but have multiple effects on, um, on cell function. Um, but what I will highlight is that there's some site-specific damage, region-specific damage, and damage to promoter sequences or strand and uh, repair, strand or gene-specific repair. These are all factors that contribute towards a non-random distribution of damage, and that's something just to keep in your mind because um, we'll be referring to it later. So hopefully those preceding sites have, have emphasized, if you didn't already know, why we need to mark biomonitor DNA damage. And doing that is not entirely simple. Generally, the targeted analysis, looking at one addict at a, at a time, that's okay so far. It's invasive, so the blood or other tissues, that's not so good, because um, that can limit uh, compliance or uh, consent, 
for approval and so on. So you could use extracellular matrices, matrices such as urine. And uh, there was a group uh, formed the European Standards Committee on Urinary DNA Lesion Analysis to look at issues surrounding the measurement of oxidatively modified DNA lesions in urine. And there is, there are, or there have been issues with methodology, uh, risk of artifact during the DNA extraction and sample workup, and, and um, ESCOD, the European Standards Committee on Oxidative DNA Damage, which preceded Escula, um, looked at the, the these sorts of uh, issues in a great deal of detail and highlighted the discrepancies between methods, which in those days were orders of magnitude. Uh, Escula did the same, following on the, the uh, coattails of the of ESCOD, perhaps. And there was a general move towards uh, low risk of artifact methods. So to talk a bit more about targeted analysis of DNA damage, these are looking for known adducts, usually one at a time. So that's just the comet assay. Okay, you don't need to know about this because you know it already. So what can the comet assay detect and what can it be used for? Um, where does it, where is it applied? Genomic instability in primary cells, cultured cells, tissues, or isolated PBMC. And this is one of our forays into the, one of our earliest forays into, not the earliest, earliest foray, into the uh, comet assay world, um, because uh, blood and isolation of PBMC presents challenges. Of course, it's necessarily invasive. Isolation is tedious, time consuming. I've done this, if you're doing it for, um, human studies, uh, and there's a significant number of people in the population, it's, it's very time consuming and labor because you have to dilute the blood, uh, layer it onto a histopack, centrifuge it, and then carefully take off this, this band of lymphocytes. And then you need to, um, you need to store the sample. So maybe you need to store the blood because if, if you're in a, um, a kind of a human study, there's probably not time to, uh, process all the blood samples that you get in on the same day. So maybe you need to freeze it and there's issues of risk of artifact. Um, so we asked ourselves, why not use whole blood directly? Um, and there was uh, some suggestions that, well, that would maybe lead to artifact because when there's the blood cells are lies, the red blood cells are lies, they release iron. And, um, but we tried it anyway. And what we showed is that you could take a pinprick of blood, less than 250 microliters. You don't need any pre-processing. You can just put it straight into the freezer, no cryopreservative. And then you could actually use it directly in the comet assay, either fresh or after the freezing. So you only need five microliters for gel. And we showed uh, convincingly it could be used with the uh, alkaline or the Hulk modified uh, comet. And the, the samples could be stored for, for quite some time without the, at least a month. And this has been extended. This uh, storage period has been extended by others in the, the field. And like I said, this was our first foray 2011 into the comet assay world. And we've, we've kept our toe in there ever since. And showing, demonstrating the usefulness of, of this uh, kind of thinking and adopting this kind of approach uh, in terms of make, developing assays that are really useful for molecular epidemiology has panned out in a, a recent uh, clinical application in a human first-in-class drug trial where um, samples were taken, pinpricks of blood were taken from the patients uh, over in uh, Scandinavia, uh, shipped to us frozen uh, in the US, and we stored them, thawed them, and analyzed them, and we, we saw you know, acceptable results, really good results, um, without any induction of artifact or anything like that. And, and they worked perfectly well in the comet assay. So it's a, a good demonstration of uh, how something that um, is very much tailored to application in the, the real world and addressing the questions, uh, real world questions. This I'll go over very quickly. It's just to demonstrate uh, how we've used the comet assay in the past to look at baseline levels of damage and assess antioxidant capacity in this particular two individuals. Um, that had a uh, genetic deficiency in selenium cysteine uh, metabolism, which rendered them particularly susceptible to oxidative stress. We also demonstrated that it, the deficiency didn't actually affect uh, basic system repair of atoxiguanine, and in both cases, we used the, the uh, Hulk modified comet assay. Got some nice data with that. Um, a little more recently, but quite interestingly, we found was that uh, we started with uh, obtained a cell line from colleagues uh, back at my previous institution um, when we were there, 
um, looking at uh, these um, neuronal cells, um, M17s, and noticed that there was all this background in some of the cells, whereas other cells that we've been used to uh, didn't have this background at, at all. And we subsequently found out, uh, kind of in hindsight, that from the ATCC website, only yesterday, I think it was, um, that actually you can see mycoplasma infections um, through the through this herx staining, and we were doing this with propylium iodide and seeing this in within the comet assay, which was an interesting kind of a side. Um, what we discovered though is that the uh, mycoplasma was having a nasty effect on the, the cells, um, quite unknown to the, the rest of the department who were using these cells uh, um, freely without any idea that they were mycoplasma infected. We saw the background levels of damage are pretty low in the cells. Then when they're mycoplasma infected, uh, oxidized purines in particular go up significantly. And when you challenge these cells with hydrogen peroxide, again, the oxidized purines go up significantly compared to the un, um, uninfected M17s. This is all done with the uh, whole comet assay. Um, the repair of strand breaks, ALS, is um, there's not much. There is a bit of a difference between infected and uninfected. Um, but when you look at oxidized purines, there's, there's a big difference between the two. Um, there's a, a kind of post-exposure increase in damage that stays sustained and uh, it's a lot slower to repair. So that it's clearly this um, bacterial infection is having a, a significant influence on oxidative stress and genetic instability. So whilst we were doing the comet assay, we did notice that there was a, a bit of an issue. It's, a, it's quite laborious. There's multiple steps, manipulating many slides individually, time consuming, risk of damage to gels and so on. Training can be challenging, although we've only found one person who couldn't really uh, take to it. Um, Scoring is increasingly automated and the footprint of the horizontal uh, electrophoresis tanks is significant. This is, this is the tank that we used to use. It would only take 40 slides and it's six coupled with the uh, the ice box rounded it's 60 by 75 centimeters, so pretty good, pretty big. So we came up with the idea of putting the slides on the side and putting them in a rack for all the steps. So the slides are headed vertically in, in the rack. They go through all the walk, work up, electrophoresis and staining steps whilst remaining in the rack. They go through these um, pots to do the uh, staining and washing and so on. And the electrophoresis is in this tank that's a lot smaller. And you can see the difference in the size of the footprint. There's uh, integrated um, cooling, so there's no ice tray, there's a little uh, ice block in there, and the whole process is accelerating. We can also uh, slave off four of these tanks, so each one of the rack carries 25, so 50 slides per tank, and we can run at least four tanks off a single power pack, um, which, given the footprint, will be much less than this, so that's a, that was a good benefit. Um, but the common acid still involves multiple steps, and um, we thought that that's still fairly laborious and what we could perhaps do is address that by automation. So we had a, an artist's impression um, of, of what it could look like, a device to automatically process slides for the comment. I said, they asked me to draw this and I said, I don't do impressions. Um, then this is actually what our colleagues uh, in engineering came up with, um, which wasn't particularly attractive, but did the job. And this is what we're working on now. There's a lot of dead space here, but this is the, this is kind of the prototype. This is proof of principle. This is now the prototype. Um, so when we talk about analysis of DNA damage, we're, we're looking at all the DNA damage, but um, you have to think that damage is not uh, evenly distributed throughout the DNA. There's some regions where there's lots of damage and some regions where there's not. And maybe functionally, it would be more informative instead of measuring some total levels of uh, damage, we ought to look at where the damage is to see if there's functional consequences. And we started thinking about this back in the late 1990s. Um, and unfortunately, uh, next generation sequencing hadn't been invented then, and we weren't able to find a technique that kind of came up with looking at multiple genes or multiple regions. Um, we could look at uh, one gene at a time or maybe two, but um, we couldn't look at the entire genome. And then, when that did come along, we developed a method called damaged DNA immunoprecipitation with sequencing. We enriched the damage uh, containing fragments and then sequencing it. We used this to map the uh, thymine dimer, UV product, generated product, across both the nuclear and mitochondrial genomes. This is representative data of what it looks like, damage across the, the genome. So it's, it's clearly not 
even across the entire genome. And we pull out some uh, random, pretty much um, some key genes, uh, not key genes, but randomly picked out um, just to illustrate kind of high levels of damage and low levels of damage. This is nuclear DNA. And 24 hours later, you can see that some areas have been repaired uh, completely and some areas haven't got, uh, still nearly have the uh, same as the original amount of uh, damage present. So the, the starting amount of damage doesn't relate to the amount of repair. Mitochondrial genome heavily damaged um, and then some repair. So there was a couple of uh, three take home messages from this. Clearly the differential formation and repair of damage across both the uh, nuclear and uh, mitochondrial genomes. Um, Global genome DNA repair doesn't reflect repair at sequence specific levels. So that was something that we, we highlighted. So you know, maybe the comet assay is useful to look at the total repair within the genome, but it's not really reflective of what's going on, on at uh, levels in specific sequences. We also highlighted the or identified removal of TT from mitochondrial DNA. And th this was a bit odd because the, the processes, the pathways for repairing TT, nucleotide excision repair, aren't, haven't actually been reported to uh, be present in mitochondrial DNA. So that's the amazing question that needs answering. Another approach uh, that I mentioned earlier, looking at um, damage in extracellular matrices. So we've spent uh, 23 years, as I worked out this morning, uh, looking at this particular product, ATOX DG in urine, which is 1998, when we first reported on that. But really, any kind of fluid you can squeeze out of somebody, you can probably find the ATOX DG in it. Um, and this was this is a good alternative to, to relying on uh, tissues, as there are other adducts present there. Not surprisingly, these are some that have been measured to date. So now moving on to untargeted analyses of, um, of DNA damage. So these are looking for multiple. These approaches look for multiple expected and unexpected adducts simultaneously. Um, so remember, there's multiple forms of damage, but few methods detect more than one. And we need to look at multiple forms because there's multiple exposures and there's a link between the two. Uh, P32 post-labeling was popular at one point, um, and that, that did offer the potential to look at uh, more than one product, but it, again, it's, it doesn't have the power of the technique that I'm about to show you in a bit. Um, so we need unbiased methods to help characterize the human exposome. So adectomics uh, was born initially. It was uh, protein adectomics, and then DNA adectomics, and the omics, like I mentioned previously, Measure, refers to the measurement of the totality of ADEX, so, or does it, in terms of totality, has that been achieved? We'll see. So briefly, um, DNA extraction, this is cellular DNA adectomics, DNA extraction, DNA hydrolysis, and then the adduct analysis. Um, you can do targeted analysis or high resolution mass spec to look at the adectomics, and it essentially uh, relies, adectomics oops, relies, without getting into too much detail, on the neutral loss of the, uh, the sugar, leaving behind the adductive nucleobase. Okay, so it would be like breaking that bond in ATOX-ODG. And this is the kind of thing you see. We treated some mice with various um, agents, and you can see that the, 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 this is an adductome map, so the spots refer to specific adducts, so we have a standard for this one, so we can identify this spot, and the colors relate to the intensity. And you can see when you treat them, they look very different to the control, and there's background levels of damage in the control. Limps of cellular uh, DNA adductomics is obviously that it's, it's invasive. Um, you need tissue, you need quite a lot of tissue, so molecular, for molecular epidemiology, this isn't such a good technique. Um, not least then you have all the issues with uh, extraction and hydrolysis if you're not careful and risk of artifact. So we thought, well, we spent a lot of time uh, measuring adducts in urine and had a bit of a eureka moment when uh, we thought, well, why don't we measure multiple adducts, use the adductomics approach and measure multiple adducts in um, urine, remembering that the DNA adducts, uh, the repair of adducts results in their appearance in urine, so they remove from DNA end up in the urine. So in the same mice as we had previously, these are the, the urinary DNA adductomes, and unfortunately, they uh, all looked pretty much the same as, as you can see, I think, um, as the control. Intensity of some spots have varied, but there are no new adducts, and that was really surprising. And I, I spoke to my colleagues at the time who had done this work, and I said to them, uh, how are these adducts that are induced by all these agents, how are they, uh, how are they repaired? And they said, base excision repair. And I said, ah, but we're looking at deoxynucleosides in urine. So the 
the products of repair of these would be the nuclear base. So it was, yes, urine DNA adaptogenics is possible, but it was a bit of a case of back to the drawing board because um, the why here is the products we're looking for are nuclear bases, modified nuclear bases, not modified deoxy euphysite. So we have to come up with a new strategy, and we did. It's, it's here if you want to look at it, but the bottom line is that we can now look at nuclear base adducts and deoxynucleoside adducts. So these are the nuclear bases, these are standards that we put in, and these are deoxynucleosides. These are standards that we put into the system to show that it, 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 they can, it works. And also it allows you to identify, we know where the spot is and you can identify these spots are, are characteristic of particular adducts. Um, this is interesting because we're starting to see adducts uh, for cytosine and thymine, and these are generally not uh, described much. Guanine-derived adducts and adenine-derived adducts are, are more frequently reported in the literature, but we're seeing quite a few C and T derived. And then when you look at the patient's urine, there, there's a lot more adducts there, and there's a lot more, um, lot more spots, so novel adducts or unexpected adducts, and the colours are... Um, more towards the red and the black end, so there's more of them. So we can now look at, um, non-invasively look at uh, the totality of adducts in, in urea, and it just gets better. Um, this is what we, our initial foray into the, the field, and then we now actually, where we're seeing multiple ad ions or adducts clearly, but now we're getting up to 445 adducts. So um, we're need needing to get into some, complex data analysis, which is uh, beyond the scope of, of my expertise, but um, we are working with the University of Minnesota to publish this paper describing the development of a, um, an adductome database to help uh, identify, could more rapidly identify the spots that we're seeing in these adductome maps. Um, there are limitations in addition to uh, being invasive and all the issues of DNA extraction and so on. It doesn't quite, quite detect all the adducts, uh, primidine diamonds so far, uh, we don't seem to think that they're detected. Classically, DNA, DNA crosslinks aren't detected. DNA protein crosslinks aren't detected. So we've developed a separate method to look at DNA crosslinks. So that's DNA crosslink omics. Okay, so going back to the original question, is there still a role for targeted analysis? Well, many of the environmental agents act via oxidative stress and mechanistically, it's in Targeted analyses are mechanistically informative. Um, Biomonitoring oxidative stress will inform on body burden of key environmental toxicants, so that's good. Uh, Biomonitoring may link exposures, um, external and internal exposures, and represent biomarkers of exposure and effect. And then moving on to the untargeted approach, I think they, they have the potential to, to comprehensively and non invasively, in the case of urinary adductomics, to assess the totality of DNA adducts. Um, we could start maybe looking at RNA, and this uh, Takashita and Canali uh, published uh, RNA adductomics uh, recently. Um, and adductomics has a, is a powerful technique, so we're looking at both the, the sequencing, like DDIP-seq, or the um, cellular and urinary DNA adductomics using high-resolution mass spec. Costs will come down with time, as we've seen with proteomics and genomics. Um, and I, I'm, fairly convinced that urinary DNA adductomics is likely to be paradigm changing for exposure and risk assessment which is simply due to the power of being able to uh, measure multiple adducts. Acknowledging the uh, various people who have uh, kindly funded me uh, over the years, currently the, um, the R01 for the uh, DNA adductomics and the R41 for the automation of the, the comet assay and the R03 which is the um, adductome database. A uh, good cast is worth repeating, so a special thanks to all the people that have contributed to this work over the years. Um, and in, in particular, uh, Roger, who sent uh, uh, one of his students, Shores, to me um, back in 2010, 2011. And just as Shores was uh, leaving, we decided to have a, a quick test of the does frozen blood work in the comet assay. And uh, well, the rest is history, we've seen the paper. Um, and then the people from a schooler, which I didn't have time to talk about, and also the analysis of uh, urinary ADEX, so DG, there's the DDIP seek people, um, it's a bit of a who's who of um, public health and molecular epidemiology. Um, I always used to 
uh, see people, particularly from the US, showing where they came from. And I never showed this because this was back at the University of Leicester, and that was my view out of the office window over the bins, uh, looking at the canteen. Uh, that's my view now, um, which is a bit more pleasant. And just to let you know that there's a postdoc position going in at Optomix if you want to email me, if you have the expertise associated with, with mass spectrometry, um, either protein or DNA at Optomix, that would be, I'd be good. To, Pleased to hear from you. Thanks very much. I'd be happy to take any questions. I hope I haven't overrun. Oh yes, the Compact 50. Yeah, um, that's it. Sadly, it's no longer available. Yes, but we are um, in the process. The um, the intellectual property people at um, uh, USF have acquired the patent from uh, University of Leicester, and they're currently looking for. Uh, companies to partner with to, to continue producing the, the, the Compact 50 or a, a version thereof. So um, watch this space. Uh, we still use it. We've got several systems, um, which unfortunately we can't share. But um, yeah, yeah, it's very good. And it's a, a, a shame it's not a, available at the moment. But the um, yeah, hopefully at some point it will become available again. Yeah, some years ago, or... <laughs> A lot of years ago, <laughs> there was <laughs> there was quite some discussion about the source of oxidative DNA damage in urine. Right? So you have all those adducts in the urine, and you actually don't know where they come from. Is it DNA repair? Is it cell turnover? Is it the, the nucleotide pool that is being oxidized? So what, what is now the status? Do we now know where these uh, adducts in urine come from? It, it's ironic, isn't it, that uh, 23 years later, we're still measuring something that we don't know where it comes from. I don't know whether there's any other field that would find that acceptable. Um, but to answer that question, uh, as part of the R R01, um, we have a number of uh, four or five specific knockout, DNA repair knockout animals that we're going to treat with, in this case, benzene, and look to see whether the addicts are present in urine or not. So hopefully that's going to give us a clue. Um, then we have the MTH1 mice, um, AAG, uh, XPC, uh, XPA. So we have a number of uh, mice that we're going, hopefully we'll, you know, dissect that. We did publish something back in uh, 2016 in FRBM uh, showing that the XPA and XPC mice, which relate to global uh, genome, NER and TCR respectively, don't see uh, that there's no loss of adducts. Uh, when those genes are mutated. So it kind of suggests that they're not, uh, that those pathways aren't responsible. Um, but we didn't say, we said where, what pathways aren't responsible as opposed to saying what pathways are responsible. So the, the question still exists. Yeah, good point. In regard to, to exposome markers, how is it, uh, how is it important to measure uh, uh, exposure to mixture as opposed to single, compounds, both in vitro and in vivo, due to additive synergistic effects. Yeah, I, that was, that's the beauty of, of coming up with something like the, the idea of the exposome is that you can put the idea out there without necessarily having any idea how you can actually achieve those measurements. Um, clearly, it's important as a, as a hypothesis that the exposure to complex mixtures across the lifespan, but how are we actually going to achieve that? Now, we're starting to work towards that, but yeah, you, you're right. I mean, it's assessment of complex mixtures. Um, and that's where untargeted analysis comes in. What used to be called um, a fishing exercise in the, in the days when genomics first started is now called untargeted analysis, which is far more acceptable. Okay. But it is, it's essentially a fishing exercise because you don't know what's out there. But yeah, I, no, I agree. I think we need to, we need to look at uh, look blindly, if you like, at, at exposures. Um, same, you know, with, with adducts as well as the actual um, compounds in the environment. Uh, and clearly a lot of people are going uh, a long way to, to doing that in air, for example, and water and so on. Sure. Uh, the, the, then the problem will be uh, putting all that data together, the exposures from air, water, diet, and so on, combining it with adducts. Uh, and genetic background, albeit to a lesser extent, and trying to make sense of it. And that's something for bioinformaticians in the future. 